entertain. I'm Sue O'Connell. Tonight on Greater Boston, the Department of Justice found several policy violations in their ethics investigation into Rachel Rollins, who plans to resign as U.S. Attorney of Massachusetts. Then, FDA advisors have recommended approval of the first over-the-counter birth control pill. How soon could we see it on the shelves? Rachel Rollins, who's set to resign as U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts by the end of the week, tried to influence the outcome of the race to replace her as Suffolk District Attorney and leaked DOJ information in the process, according to two federal watchdog agencies. The DOJ Inspector General just released findings from a months-long ethics probe into Rollins, which found that she disclosed, quote, non-public sensitive DOJ information, end quote, to the press in an effort to damage the campaign of now DA Kevin Hayden, who was running against her ally Ricardo Arroyo. The Inspector General report also found she gave false testimony during the investigation and accepted payment for travel in violation of department policies. Another federal watchdog, the Office of the Special Counsel, shared similar findings and called Rollins' actions, quote, among the most egregious transgressions, end quote, of the Hatch Act they've ever investigated. The act bars federal employees from engaging in partisan political activities while on the job. The investigation first began just six months after she took office, following a contentious confirmation process when one of her chief detractors in Congress, Republican Senator Tom Cotton, asked the IG to look into a DNC fundraiser in Andover with First Lady Jill Biden. Of course, we now know both investigations ended up focusing on much more than just one political event. Now Rollins is set to leave the office after less than a year and a half on the job and after a decades-long career punctuated by controversy, praise, and several historic firsts. Joining me to discuss is former U.S. Attorney Michael Sullivan, who was appointed by George W. Bush. He is now a partner with the Ashcroft Group. And GBH News investigative reporter Philip Martin, welcome to both of you. Um, Michael Sullivan, I just want to start with you. If, if you can give us a sense, I feel so... Um, overwhelmed with investigations right now, both on the national level, through the Trump families, the accusations of the Biden family. How serious is this, in a, in, from, a, from a layman's perspective, how serious is this? Well, uh, Sue, th thank you very much for having me on uh, this afternoon. I have not uh, read the, uh, the IG report. You know, I, I think um, nobody welcomes uh, being the target of an IG report, the Office of Inspector General, you know, uh, tries to do, I think, a very thorough job, uh, tries to do a very complete job, typically outlines the various steps the Inspector General's office has taken, but may not fully capture all the defenses and or explanations by the uh, target. Um, in this particular case, I don't think we've heard much from um, you know, uh, U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins at, up to this point in time. But what I understand is in the uh, the IG report is pretty scathing because of the breadth of it. Uh, you might look at some of the individual accusations that have been reported thus far, and in and of itself would probably not lead to, um, you know, a, a resignation or request by the president uh, for the person to uh, to leave office. But it might be the the accumulation of all these various events that led Rachel to decide it's best for her to resign at this point in time as opposed to being a further distraction. At the end of the day, the only person that can remove Rachel Rollins from office is the president of the United States. He's the one who put her there. It would be up to him to ask for her resignation if it got to that point. And certainly long before that happened, it looks like Rachel has decided on her own. It's best for the uh, the work of the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office I want to, to get, resign. I want to get into that in just a second, Michael, but I want to stay with you uh, for one more second here. Can, can you explain to us, this is something that I think uh, folks have a hard time understanding. When you're an elected official or an appointed official, um, 
and you're in politics. I mean, sometimes you're elected, sometimes you're an elected judge, or you're elected attorney general, or you're appointed um, in, as, a, as an attorney. Um, why can't you participate in the politics that put you <laughs> where you got to be? I mean, she was an appointed person by the president, as you noted. Um, what's wrong with going to a fundraiser? What's wrong with participating in who you would like to, to take over the job that you just left? Well, I mean, those are terrific questions, and I've not looked at the Hatch Act recently since I've not been in public office for, for a number of years. I think there's a fair amount of gray area in the Hatch Act. There's some pretty hard, bright lines, obviously, as a appointed um, a political and non-political person in government. You can't solicit funds for political purposes. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one. But the idea of not being able to attend a political event, unless that is a new interpretation of the Hatch Act, I never understood that that to be an absolute bar for people in uh, uh, politically appointed positions from attending. I do recall when I was U.S. Attorney, uh, then President George W. Bush instructed the U.S. Attorney's Office, U.S. Attorneys, not to participate in political events. I thought that went. Uh, beyond what the uh, the Hatch Act required, and we didn't, and, and we didn't because we didn't want to have uh, any appearance of a potential conflict. The job itself should be uh, nonpartisan, non-political, not influenced by either political party, uh, and people should have confidence that you're doing the work of the office. I want to, uh, without any you know, leanings uh, either way. I want to turn to the allegations regarding Arroyo and um, Hayden. Uh, this is from the DOJ report. When asked if she had any concerns at the time that her communications with Arroyo might violate her legal and ethical obligations under the Hatch Act and DOJ policy, Rollins stated, I didn't because I believed I was having them in my individual capacity. These are not secrets that I'm telling. I didn't give any confidential, private, top secret, you know, privileged information. I was talking with a friend after hours about questions he had regarding the office that I used to lead and, poli lead and policies that I had implemented. Um, Philip, um, the reaction in the community of folks that I've been talking to is both shock and concern because they've been hearing some of these rumors, especially around the Hayden situation uh, since it happened. Can you refresh our memory why it was so newsworthy when it happened? Well, it's newsworthy because um, it was a clear violation of um, not just the, uh, the Hatch Act, but it was seen as problematic uh, in the context of uh, of Rachel Rollins' duties as a U.S. Uh, attorney. Uh, once you become a U.S. attorney, whatever uh, 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 jurisprudence philosophy you may have had as district attorney, that she may have had as district attorney in terms of progressive politics and so on and so forth, well, that became uh, irrelevant uh, because now uh, everything she did was under the, um, under the guard, under the dictate of the U.S. Department of Justice. And this was seen as flagrantly political, assisting uh, a royal in this in this capacity. And so I I think what's happening right now, I think the, what you what we're seeing now is shock because no one would have been surprised uh, had the violation of the Hatch Act been confined to attending the uh, the fundraiser for Joe Biden in Andover. That was expected. Uh, the inspector general was looking at that. The office of special counsel was looking at that. Well, that was expected to be, if you will, sort of a slap on the wrist. I, I think the additional revelation about Royal, uh, I think it's overwhelming for a number of people because it seems for, for many people flagrantly political. Uh, and let me also mention as an aside, there have been numerous violations of the Hatch Act under the years, most notably under the Trump administration, at least 13 violations, some of them absolutely flagrant, uh, such as that um, uh, associated with Kellyanne Conway. Uh, but, I, but what the Biden administration has attempted to do, of course, is to create and establish a drama-free justice department and heretofore, there have not, we have not seen any scandals. And I think to your question about her, uh, about Biden, I think she resigned uh, not, uh, or is resigning on Friday, 
uh, so that uh, as not to uh, create a crisis within the Biden administration that so far has been crisis free, uh, not counting the the full crisis over a Hunter Biden, which is not uh, which so far there's not been a shred of evidence to implicate whatever Hunter Biden was up to with the uh, with the Biden administration. There was a response from Rachel Wallens uh, last week, last Friday, May 12th, uh, in response to the draft special counsel report, where she said, uh, to both your points, I think, we feel compelled to note that the irony that the investigation into the potential violation of the Hatch Act by Ms. Rollins was publicly demanded by Senator Tom Cotton, Republican, a strong supporter of former President Donald J. Trump. The Trump administration was popular by several high-ranking officials who openly, routinely, and defiantly violated the Hatch Act with no consequences. But, Philip, at the same time, I've heard a number of people say when this investigation was announced that they knew, and she knew, Rachel Rollins knew, that she had a target on her back because of her progressive politics, because of her progressive ideas regarding the office, whether you agree with them or not, and not adhering to the highest ethical standards uh, in her behavior um, what is basically self-sabotage. What, what's your reaction to that? Well, that probably represents the greatest uh, uh, level of uh, disappointment for her supporters because for the very reasons that you just uh, stated, uh, Sue, uh, if you know that uh, you are already deemed, in the, in the words of uh, Arkansas Republican Senator Tom Cotton as pro-criminal, uh, a term like that, of course, which makes no sense, uh, then you already realize that you are uh, in for a world of hurt uh, if you violate uh, your uh, your oath of office in any way, shape, form, or fashion, or perceive to uh, violate it. Uh, and so for those who believe, uh, who embrace a progressive um, uh, philosophy as far as criminal justice uh, reform, so on and so forth. And if right, Richard Rollins is seen as a standard bearer of that of that jurisprudence philosophy, uh, to have committed uh, any type of uh, of error, uh, of course, just feeds into the narrative uh, promulgated by Senator Cotton and others. Of whether it is true or not, it is seen as uh, a problematic uh, and a contradiction of uh, of that oath of office and thus uh, giving ammunition uh, to uh, your detractors. So Michael Sullivan, what, is, what does Joe Biden do? Does Joe Biden uh, try to replace, I mean, we've got the Dianne Feinstein uh, Stein, uh, Stein issue, uh, whether or not on the Judicial Committee, whether she's gonna be there or not and how she's feeling. Does he just appoint the second in command as an acting, uh, you know, what, what happens? Or does this just halt everything that's happening in that office? Well, certainly not everything in the office will not halt. We have transitions from U.S. attorney after every presidential uh, election. The office continues to do the important work of the office, the federal and state and local law enforcement offices to work with, will continue to work with the assistants throughout the office. The, many of them are career, many spend a number of years there. That, that work will continue. Uh, there's a terrific first assistant in Joss Levy, uh, who's there right now. I suspect he'll become the acting U.S. attorney. That's the standard practice when the U.S. attorney vacates the, the office. And I would imagine there'll be at least some effort to put in a presidentially nominated, Senate-confirmed U.S. attorney uh, uh, as soon as practical from the two uh, Democratic senators' perspective. They'll weigh in, I'm sure, as quickly as they can and try to get a permanent replacement as U.S. attorney. Uh, Phil, Rachel Rollins had a lot of Democratic supporters here in the state, the, the Democratic senators, a number of other people, uh, Joe Biden, obviously. Uh, does this impact them in any kind of negative way? Well, to the degree that uh, they will be considered uh, having committed an error in um, nominating, um, uh, and of course we're talking about the two senators, uh, Markey and Warren, of having nominated um, uh, Rachel Rollins to this position, but not really. She, I think uh, in, in the final analysis, she is, will still be seen, I think by many, uh, as, uh, as, a, as someone who stood by their convictions, so on and so forth, who made, it, uh, a, who made a grievous error. Uh, but I don't think, I, I haven't heard uh, anything close to an apology uh, from the two, our two senators. 
Uh, and I also believe that uh, she will maintain support among, uh, if you will, the Democratic Party operatives. Um, and, and so I think that this will have repercussions, yes, and it will feed into a narrative advanced again by her detractors, uh, notably um, uh, uh, Tom Cotton of Arkansas uh, and other uh, uh, staunch uh, right-wing Republicans. <clears throat> but I don't think it will, uh, in the long run, I think eviscerate uh, her, uh, uh, her, her standing within the Democratic Party. As far as advancing politically, that it will have an impact without question uh, I, in terms of her running for uh, another office, so on and so forth. Michael Sullivan, do you have any quickly any advice for her replacement? Um, you know, the, the work in the office is important. I think Rachel Rollins understood and appreciated that. I think the person that gets hurt the most in this is uh, Rachel herself. I think deep down she's a good, decent, uh, caring person, and she's had several, according to the IG, she said several serious lapses in uh, judgment. All right. I thank you both for your perspective and joining us, Michael and Philip. Appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, as more and more states move to ban abortion and a federal case before the Supreme Court seeks to take the abortion pill off the market for the entire country, the FDA is taking steps to increase access to another drug central to reproductive health care, the birth control pill. Earlier this month, advisors for the agency voted unanimously in support of making the birth control pill drug known as Opil available over the counter, saying the benefits of greater access outweigh any risk. Risks. The advisor's vote isn't binding, but the FDA often follows their advice and is expected to make the final call in the coming months. So, what kind of impact would this decision have? And are there legal challenges ahead? I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Janiak, a public health researcher and assistant professor of OBGYN and reproductive biology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Renee Landers, a professor of law at Suffolk University and vice chair of the board of directors for Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts. Welcome to you both, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having us. So before we get into this pill, just for history's sake, how revolutionary was the original birth control pill, and are we still seeing the benefits of that being introduced into our, our lives? Well, I mean, the original pill, I think, was certainly revolutionary, and um, we can see its influence throughout pop culture and songs like I've Got the Pill, which I, which I encourage everyone to look up if you've never heard it, um, really as being uniquely liberating for people to have sex without doing so for the purposes of, rec of procreation. Um, so absolutely had a wide impact. And the pill has become more refined over the years, safer, now exists in many different formulations, as well as having led to the development of subsequent shorter acting reversible methods like the, the patch, the ring, and the contraceptive shot. And when we look at the health impact, um, besides preventing pregnancy, the pill also, various pills also treat other things that women suffer mm -hmm. through or symptoms that they have and help control it. Um, what would this new pill do? So this new pill is a progestin-only pill, um, which means it's similar to the two formulas that were introduced for over-the-counter use in England a couple of years ago. And um, one of the things about progestin-only pills to keep in mind is that they have very few contraindications. So um, the vast majority of people can use them safely. There's only one medical condition that the Centers for Disease Control says is absolutely contraindicates the use of this pill, which is currently having breast cancer. So they're very low risk, um, useful to a wide range of people, and helpful, of course, for preventing pregnancy, as well as for regulating any symptoms related to menstruation or other non-contraceptive uh, non uses, excuse me, that people use the pill for. You know, Renee, I think um, uh, probably 10 years ago, we would have thought that the introduction of a new birth control pill would just be celebrated and, um, you know, barring any any challenges with how it was going to be released or any of the technical stuff, we'd just be throwing a parade and saying, yay. But there are a number of legal challenges that have been swirling around uh, both access to abortion care, the abortion pill, and birth control in general. What's your take on what's going to happen with this? 
Well, right, <clears throat> right now, I would say that the um, anti-abortion activists have, you know, sort of held their fire about the, uh, pr you know, potential um, authorization or approval of over-the-counter use of Opil. But I think that, um, you know, that this is this is just the quiet before the storm because if there's anything that we can learn from the uh, litigation challenging the FDA's approval of mifepristone which you know we don't have to go down that rabbit hole to discuss all of those issues today but is that um, all if the courts uphold that challenge then all bets are off about whether the courts will uphold any future drug or any approval that the FDA makes of any future drug or any kind of you know medical device or anything like that so I think that that's really what the risk is here um, in addition the, just to get one other set of legal challenges out on the table, <clears throat> right now, um, prescription contraception is something that has to be available uh, under the provisions of the Affordable Care Act um, without copay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so one of the challenge com challenges coming up for Opil, if, if it's over the counter, um, mm -hmm. you know, people will have to pay for it unless there's a modification in the regulations about coverage for um, the non-prescription version. Um, and then second, um, there's another challenge um, going on in Texas to the requirements under the Affordable Care Act that certain preventive health services be made available on people's insurance policies and people are challenging um, those provisions on a whole variety of technical legal grounds, but including religious objections to some of the coverages. So I think, you know, contraception has already been litigated. Um, now, um, you know, they're going after um, medications to uh, uh, treat um, and prevent um, HIV infections. So it's, um, I think it's a very fraught area, and you cannot be confident that once <clears throat> excuse me, the FDA approves it, that all will be well and it will be available. And I, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but I always feel compelled to point out that, that and, and you'll correct me and add to this, um, the idea that lawmakers with no medical training would be saying what the FDA should and shouldn't approve regarding medical devices, not just for birth control, we're talking about everything the FDA is involved with, is what people are very concerned about, right? They they definitely are. And you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry and you know, a lot of people who work in regulatory law would be the last people to say that everything that the FDA does is perfect uh, and that there, there sh should be avail you know, an available means to challenge some of the decisions they make. But the basis on which these the decisions about mifepristone were made are you know, totally um, not reliant on the facts that exist in the world and are, um, are you know, really um, you know, really quite concerning for the future of drug approval, approvals. Doctor, I often have conversations with people um, when they're talking about um, w the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm always shocked at how they don't really get how the unplanned pregnancy number has dropped so dramatically um, almost every decade since the introduction of the original birth control pill. And the number of abortions has dropped um, it, it just it seems to me that um, if you want to have fewer abortions, you would want to have more access to birth control. And this would seem to be something folks could get behind. I think that makes sense from a public health perspective. So for I absolutely agree that it, it is logical to me. I think politically, um, one of the challenges is that many people who oppose abortion also oppose the use of contraception for related reasons. They may have a worldview often grounded in theology that um, prompts them to oppose any sexual activity that's not for procreative purposes. And of course, along with that, opposing any sexual activity outside of a heterosexual marriage. So they are really related conceptually for a lot of folks, I think, who are opposed to abortion, also oppose contraception, because it's less about preventing abortion through a kind of logical or public health informed lens for many folks, and more about a vision of our society in which everyone should be in a married monogamous relationship and a certain vision for the kind of society that they would like to see. I think that 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 
just the way that the pill revolutionized um, sexual politics and women's participation in the workforce and civic life and the family in the United States, you know, that's exactly the same dynamic that people who oppose these methods are responding to. They don't want to see that change. Um, and so I think that that does, you know, actually make sense to oppose both. I will say that I that where I see a real difference in terms of some of the misinformation campaigns and the potential use of tactics, like uh, similar to what we've seen against Mifeprex, is that one of the tactics folks who oppose abortion use is to under mind the scientific consensus about the safety of abortion. And they can sometimes get away with that because abortion is highly stigmatized in our society. We don't have personal experience with it, or if we do, we don't talk about it with our friends and family. And contraception is not as stigmatized, right? So I think it would be much harder to sell the public the lie that contraception is not safe and shouldn't have been approved by the FDA, in part because so many people have used the pill, right? Um, one in five people who are using contraception right now in this country are using the pill. Everyone has used it themselves or has a friend or a partner who has done so, or Some at least they've heard about it. people use it not for birth control, they use it for exactly. controlling other symptoms. And so I think we, you know, with 63 years post-approval use in the United States, um, it would be really hard to sell the lie to the public that birth control is not safe, where it's a little easier to sell that lie about abortion, even though both are completely false. Are you up? Go ahead. No, but I, I would say that in addition to that, though, um, is the problem that um, the the uh, the opponents of abortion and uh, the use of contraception also discount um, uh, the risk of pregnancy. Um, when I teach these cases in constitutional law, I always I always start with the statistics about pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes and the risks of pregnancy because that's really the comparator here. Um, it's not um, you know you know you know any of necessarily these risks because these drugs are very safe, but it's because um, uh, you know what if people might be wanting to avoid the risks of pregnancy. And the United States has some of the worst pregnancy outcomes in the developed world um, and uh, which is you know really quite shocking because of the amount of money that we invest in healthcare generally as we wrap do you are you optimistic that this will move forward and I will say I'm not a professional FDA prognosticator so you know I, I do think it's extraordinarily rare for the FDA not to follow the recommendation um, and as I alluded to earlier the Oral contraceptives were over the counter in a hundred countries worldwide, and including in places like England, which just approved a few years ago a similar pill. So the evidence is incredibly strong that it's appropriate to approve this for over the counter use. So I'm hopeful that the FDA will follow the evidence base. Quickly, yes. Good yes, I, I completely agree. Okay, great. Thank you both for joining us. It was great to meet you, Dr. Elizabeth Daniak and Renee Landers. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching. I'm Sue O'Connell. Good night.